This time we're going to look at a uh, very old power supply. Right, so first of all, there are screws. You can actually open it. Uh, there are security torques, so torques with a little uh, thing in the middle. The second thing that's uh, very obvious why this is a, an older power supply is um, that the input power is 29 volt amps at 100 volts and 39 volt amps at 240 volts. So this is a variable voltage. This is probably this has some kind of either PFC or it's just over dimension to also work on a lower voltage. This is not something you uh, generally see at uh, in modern power supplies. One of the reasons why this could be is because they use an older style forward converter inside here. Uh, but we'll see. Anyway, it's uh, UL listed. It says complies Canada ICES 003. That's essentially CSA compliance. Maybe CSA wasn't a thing back then. So let's open her up. So yeah, this is definitely an older power supply. The first thing I'll do is uh, look at some date codes to see exactly what vintage this is. Uh, but this here is made from PPE plastic, which is polyphenylene ether. It's not uh, polypropylene. PPE is like a worse ABS plastic. It uh, shatters uh, much more easily. Let me see if I can... No, it's actually pretty tough. It's also the plastic they used on older laptops that kind of changed color um, after a while when uh, exposed to ozone and uh, sunlight. It has screws, so it's uh, easily disassemblable and it did not have any shielding uh, around it. So it's uh, probably not e EMI compliant anymore. Okay, let's let's first just look at the um, at this chip. Ah, doesn't have a date code. Uh, gonna have to look a bit harder. Uh, by the way, this is just a uh, dual op-amp. It's an LM2902 um, box standard op-amp, almost as standard as the LM358. There's just absolutely nothing I can find on the PCB with a date code. I mean, possibly this transformer 7898 has something to do with it, so it's 1998. But... Uh, Geez, and it, the the problem with that theory is that this has a 7883 code on it. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so maybe the 78 is actually something to do with this product. So I'm I'm not sure. Uh, we're gonna have to look at the uh, UL listing. Uh, nope. Uh, it just says they last updated in 2009, but. This is definitely not a 2009 PSU, so I'm going to look a bit further. Well, it's absolutely impossible to find any information. Uh, there are no date codes anywhere. I even desoldered the uh, this big X2 cap to see if there's a date code on it, but nothing. So I decided to remove the uh, heatsink that was here, uh, which I'll talk about later, and um, discovered an MIP2C5 which is one of those, um, they call it IPDs, or uh, Integrated Power Devices. Basically a, a switcher on a chip. These chips first came out at the start of the 2000s, so I would say this is like a, an early 2000s, maybe 2002, 2003 power supply. Which is, uh, yeah, I, I, I could imagine that. This does do flyback, so it is actually a flyback uh, supply, but the reason that it uh, seems to have a higher input power at higher voltages is simply that it can't really modulate its power very well. Basically, its output duty cycle is fairly well matched to the input, so it, its power factor is a bit higher at a lower input voltage, and as the voltage gets higher, the pulses from the um, PWM controller become shorter and it has a worse power factor. Um, that's the only thing I can really see. There's no reason why it should actually be less efficient. It just has a lower power factor at higher input voltage. So what, what I wanted to show about this heatsink is it's it's brass and it's obviously designed to exclusively cool that, that one chip. It sat with this flat part over that chip like that. 
Well, they obviously they chose brass instead of aluminum or copper because it has a slightly lower thermal conductivity and they, they obviously wanted to make a one piece solution. So nowadays you see aluminum heat sinks, but they have little steel tabs on it that actually solder to the PCB. And this is just all integrated and they made a little hole near the solder connections. So this is like a thermal break. So this can heat up without losing too much heat to the rest of the heat sink. Anyway, the real power supply, let's just follow components. So you have the incoming power. Uh, really cool to see is that every part, this part, this part, this part, even this part, they all have UL markings. Uh, this one even has Kemakur, which is a Dutch certification, independent certification. So it comes in through the two prong adapter, goes through a fuse, one amp, 250 volt rated fuse then through this X2 rated capacitor, which is a 0.1 microfarad capacitor, through a common mode choke, and on the reverse side, there's the diode bridge and of course the bleeder resistors, and it goes into a big Rubicon cap, which is a very high quality, the SXW, uh, fairly uh, well, like medium current, high voltage, uh, high capacity capacitor type. Well then we have the actual switching part. It's made very easy by this uh, this part, this part just uh, basically make, makes it a one component switching supply. Goes into the transformer, uh, it still needs a freewheeling diode here, uh, so that's under that gunk there. On the output there's just this diode, and interestingly they heat shrunk a little NTC around it that does some thermal feedback, which is pretty cool. We also see a loading resistor, this is just a resistor that creates a minimum load so that the power supply can always uh, run. I mean, uh, on the older power supplies, they cannot stop switching. So what happens at extremely low load or no load is that the power supply, it puts some energy in the transformer, puts a pulse in the transformer, and that energy has to go somewhere. So it goes to the output, which leads to an increase in the voltage on the capacitors. Well, if nothing is using it, then the capacitor voltage will just and keep increasing until the whole power supply just blows up. So they need a minimum load. Uh, nowadays, uh, that's kind of fixed with different approaches to that. There's an LCL filter. This is actually common mode. This is differential mode. So basically everything is accounted for. Uh, they even do some extra, I'm thinking this is actually just a voltage adjustment pot. You don't see that nowadays because very cheap components already have 1% tolerance or better. Uh, but on older power supply, they used uh, 5 or 10% resistors and they had to do some trimming on it. So it's actually cheaper to use the cheapo resistors and then a trimmer pot. Whereas nowadays, this would be a giant extra expense. Here on this board, all we really see is we see two ICs. This is a big comparator and I'm fairly like 100% sure actually that this kind of traced it out, this is the voltage reference. So this is what generates the 8.4 volts on the output, or actually what makes sure that if the voltage is higher, then this outputs a stronger signal to the optocoupler so that the primary side can switch a bit slower. And this, I think the only thing the op amp does is thermal protection. Yeah, and then we have the uh, primary to secondary side coupling with these capacitors. Uh, interesting to see is also that this here has these capacitors, I'm not 100% sure what they do. They seem to just be for anti-ringing or something, but they have a little bit of plastic protecting it, protecting it from touching, I guess, this little ferrite bead. As for the reverse side, there is essentially nothing to it. The diode bridge is the biggest component. Kind of interesting to see, like, these are bleeder resistors, these are bleeder resistors. There's a little bit of capacitance probably for the feedback circuit that comes from here. Here's the, the optocoupler. Kind of interesting to note is that there are a lot of different sizes of resistors. So this is a tiny, I think it's an 0603. And these are 1206s. And I've even seen, I've seen an 0805 somewhere. This is just a bit crazy to see so many different sizes because usually for uh, for surface mounting, you want to have kind of consistent component sizes as much as possible. Essentially, 
when you have this much space to work with it doesn't matter you can just use all 1206 but uh, yeah because otherwise you need to change out nozzles during the pick and place process so uh, yeah so primary side not that much to see uh, kind of interesting to see this they marked out the primary secondary boundary they didn't do any slot milling and they didn't remove the solder mask so this wouldn't be compliant nowadays but i'm pretty sure it was back then and on the secondary side yeah it's kind of dodgy soldering on the big diode uh, other soldering is pretty good yeah there's really nothing to see oh wait yeah here we go there are r1 i.e 100 milliohm resistors here two in parallel so it does have current sensing so the um uh, that riser board does do current sensing and temperature sensing as well and yeah the rest it's just a couple of bleeder resistors and um very minor stuff so it's a very simple power supply really so yeah there you go a pretty simple and uh pretty old power supply not sure exactly what the vintage is but um, it's obviously fairly outdated design still very decent quality good quality caps all rated components wouldn't be compliant these days because of the lack of shielding and the uh, fairly mediocre primary secondary barrier but uh, still fine wouldn't mind this uh, canon apparently buys good quality power supplies Is this this like is a, the uh, 